let's um, uh, we'll go ahead and let you let you get your seat. Uh, repeat something I repeated yesterday. I I don't ever recall um, our uh, drafting area and scouts being as enthusiastic as they were uh, uh, when it was announced that we were on the board and Dat was there. I was a fan of Dat before he even got here because I used to watch him at Texas A&M. There was always the hype about what he was and it was kind of cool to actually have him come to the team. The other thing, I don't know when I've ever been in there when more people were sticking their heads in there to the lobby at the time <laughs> either and say, we've got a chance to uh, make uh, make this pick. All the Aggie fans, oh, this, this is the greatest draft pick in, er in ever, right? They certainly were excited about it. And I think the Cowboys uh, were, you know, it's like, okay, we're going to give this guy a chance because uh, he all he does is make plays. Uh, be able to get that there in the bottom of the third was uh, outstanding value for us. And uh, when you add it all up, uh, his career, where we are, the Dallas Cowboys, uh, all the great fans that we've got that have follow, followed that through his career. That, that's a pretty, I think, uh, significant uh, thing for the Cowboys. The simple terms are the best way to describe that. He makes plays. The guy is on the field and the objective of a defensive player is to make tackles and the objective of the linebackers to avoid blockers and make tackles. And he does that. Uh, if not, the best, one of the best that's ever done it. Well, he's been one that's uh, overcome uh, odds and naysayers uh, his whole life, and yet he sits before you today. Dad's, Dad's story is, is unbelievable. His background and where he came from and, and getting to AM and getting to the league is, is a great story. Indeed it is. Dat Wynn's parents fled war-torn Vietnam in 1975 with their five children and his mother four months pregnant with Dat. Later that year, he would be born in a government-run refugee camp in Fort Chaffee, Arkansas. Together, the family would eventually settle in the Gulf Coast town of Rockport, Texas, where Wynn fell in love with football. Growing up in the state of Texas, um, that's all I knew. As, as a kid, you always have people who you look up to. And uh, obviously the Dallas Cowboys were winning and they were the best team and you know, there were some great players. And uh, for me, I, I think being being have a chance to be with the Cowboys uh, always was a dream. He would first star at Texas A&M, leading the Aggies in tackles in each of his four seasons before leaving campus with the school record for takedowns. A consensus All-American in his senior campaign, he also won the Bednarik, Lombardi, and Jack Lambert trophies. Well, you know, of course, when you watch Dad on his college football tape, I mean, he was making plays all over the tape, all right? I mean, he was a guy that wherever the ball was, he was there making a play. I mean, he had a ton of production out of, uh, at college back at Texas A&M. Still, despite all he and his family had been through, despite all of his collegiate success, many questioned whether Dat Wynn could play in the NFL. Why? It was like, now, where's he gonna play? You know, it, it, it linebacker, middle linebacker at his size? At just 5'11 and 210 pounds, could that win handle the rigors of playing linebacker in professional football? The reality kicked in that, hey, even though what you accomplished in college is not going to carry over to the National Football League. The Dallas Cowboys Legends Show is presented by AT&T, an official sponsor of the Dallas Cowboys, and by the Texas Lottery. Dallas Cowboys scratch tickets from the Texas Lottery are here play today. In the weeks leading up to the 1999 NFL Draft, Dat Wynn was obviously on the Cowboys' radar. After all, as the New York Times described him, he was a tornado in cleats. So high was the team's interest in Wynn that prior to the draft, they invited him to their Valley Ranch training facility as one of the allotted 30 prospect visits allowed by the league. Well, it was neat. It was awesome. Uh, just showing, coaches showing us around, meeting the people, meeting the players, um, meeting the whole coaching staff. It's uh, just to show us what they have to offer. I think it's a great organization, the great facilities. So, uh, we were just sitting there talking about when Dion walked by. It's like, dang, you know, you're fixing to tackle Barry Sanders. You're fixing to tackle Emmitt Smith. You're going against Troy Aikman. So it's neat. It's going to be weird, but it's going to be exciting because it's one of those times, uh, guys, you've been watching on TV for so long. You know, guys, um, 
that you were trying to imitate for so long, now you're competing against them and with them. I think that's awesome. What I remember a lot was there's some great players there. I remember talking to, spent a lot of time with George Edwards, who was my, uh, eventually became my position coach. He taught me a lot of football. Then after meeting him on the 30 visit, and just, you could just tell the detail that he put in his work and the kind of person that he was, that uh, it was going to be a good fit. Although Wynn impressed during his meeting with the Cowboys, there was still concern. Was he big enough? Had I not seen him play at A&M, I would have looked at him and said, I don't know if this guy's got the physical wherewithal to play. Well, Dak played college football at about 209 pounds most of the time. He made every damn tackle on the field for the Aggies, it seemed like. And, you know, the concern with Dak was simply his size and, you know, whatever his time speed may have been. But Dak's just, you know, football player. After a while, your memory bank is filled with Mike Singletary's and Dexter Coakley's. And there are so, some other great examples at other franchises, too. Um, Sam Mills in New Orleans was a great example. The reason why it wasn't a surprise for me is actually because I played with Zach Thomas uh, with the Dolphins before I actually came here. So I saw another undersized linebacker and saw how he could play. So having that on the team uh, with us, um, I knew he could play. From a scout's perspective, which obviously I'm not, but when you just look at the number of guys, like some of the ones I just mentioned, then you have to think after a while, this he's not checking my physical boxes, but I've seen him play, and I've seen other guys a little bit like him physically play. Let me have a few more looks. I think that had a bigger concern for it than we did. Well, most of the concern was, this guy's 210 pounds, how's he gonna hold up in the NFL? Well, he shows up to the combine, and I think he weighed 229 or 232. He must have drank half the Gulf of Mexico to get his weight up to that. You know, he didn't work out up there because he was heavy and that was, you know, he just wanted to show everybody he could add that weight on. Despite his own worries about his height, Dat Wynn was selected by the Dallas Cowboys in the third round, 85th overall in the 1999 NFL Draft. In doing so, he became the first Vietnamese American ever to be drafted. The thing we finally got that to realize was that his speed and his instincts were his superpowers. So we needed to use his superpowers and the technique and the formula he played with would take care of the rest. And once he understood that, I think he kind of understood he didn't need to be 260. Uh, even though there was a lot of linebackers that were drafted, and I think that's, it made, it made the Cowboys have the chance to pick me up since because there were so many other guys that were rated higher uh, through measurables or through whatever it is. But um, it, all, it all worked out the way it should have been. I'm pretty sure he played most of his career here with us between 215 and 220, and he made every damn tackle with us, too. I mean, he was just a phenomenal football player, one of the most likable humans you'll ever meet, and just, you know, he was fantastic for us at the time. Right from the start, uh, you, you know, you could just tell that this guy uh, he just had it. When Dat Wynn came to Dallas in 1999, the Cowboys were closing out their run as the NFL's team of the decade. Still a playoff contender, but not quite as formidable. Needless to say, there was much to learn. And that was tough when he came in the first year because of his background and he hadn't been asked to do all those things quite as much. And then all of a sudden he's put into this arena and I'll tell you, it, he just, it, he was like a sponge. And then I go to team meetings and and um, the Dallas Cowboys playbook is about this thick. Every situation you can think of. Even more eye-opening was who win now called teammates. At that point in time, you're talking about the late 90s of you know the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, there were a lot of like really good players, Hall of Fame players that were on that team. And I think as far as him, you know, looking at it coming in, he had heard of all these names. He had you know, kind of looked at those guys coming, play pro ball and all those things, and now all of a sudden he's on the field with him. We go through our first practice, and it's just seven on seven, uh, quarterbacks, receivers, running backs, tight ends versus linebackers, safeties, and cornerbacks. And uh, I remember halfway through seven on seven, I hear my name, hey, Dad, Dad. And this was Dave Campbell, our defensive coordinator. I said, get in there. Broke the huddle with the defense, I look over him. Was Troy Eggman. I look behind him, it was Emmitt Smith. I looked to my right, it was Michael Irvin. 
they snap the ball, I didn't even move. <laughs> I was so starstruck. These are the triplets. These are the guys that I watch. These are the guys I admire every Sunday for the last four or five years of my life of, of football. And I think he was trying to find his way, and I think it froze him a few times just looking at, all right, well, that's Michael Irvin over there. Or that's Deion Sanders behind me. That's Darren Woodson, you know, that I'm getting a call from. So I think those things kind of struck him, you know, at the beginning. I remember George, made, he made fun of me because he played it back and forth. Look at this guy, he didn't even move. I think it was a little overwhelming early, so I just would stop and be like, okay, what are you thinking? What are you processing right here? And just, it was trying to get him to really verbalize what it was that he was trying to think. Of course, many of those same veterans proved to be valuable resources for the young rookie. Where I walk in the building and Darren Woodson comes straight up to me. Darren said, hey, you're a great player, congratulations. Just remember that. You can be a former player, longer than you be a player. And I was like, I didn't resonate till after the off season until I realized that, but you'll be a former player, longer than you be a player. And I think you put it all in perspective. One of the things that we talked about uh, as friends, as teammates was really what his values were at home and what that meant. And he knew, you know, playing at a school like Texas A&M where football is really good and he's doing something that was never done before um, with his, um, ethnicity um, and things of that nature. So um, I think he was already embraced that, hey, I have to do more to one to even get to the National Football League. But now that I'm here, I've been drafted high. Um, he, he never took his, his foot off the gas pedal when it comes to hard work. But Dexter Copley was a big mentor for myself. And they, that was so cool about the National Football League and for the Cowboys, I think I can relate this to majority of the team that around the football, in the National Football League is that guys, even though we're competing against each other, they embrace us in as brothers and we knew we were gonna be a team and they teach us all the nuances to be a good professional. You know, there's guys, and he was one, who seem to run faster when they're chasing the ball. And there are guys who play bigger than their bodies. It, his attributes to me were um, passion, relentless, desire to be a great teammate and a great player and to make every play and those are things that you cannot coach well you know when you watch guys like him to me when you see how fast they play I don't know what his 40 time was but I know that he played fast in between the tackles and, and chasing people down a, a lot of it uh, was that speed uh, but again, just his knowledge of the game and, you know, he studied like crazy uh, and he was so motivated to, to succeed. Uh, you could just tell it. It just kind of oozed from him. But you, if, if you have a guy who has those things, those intangibles, that's what he brought. And those are things that when you find someone who has those qualities in the abundance that that win I will say has them. When you have those things, those are bigger than a lot of the physical measurables. Like every rookie, Dat Wynn's first season was one filled with learning experiences. However, one in particular stood out as perhaps his true welcome to the NFL moment. We go play Minnesota. Minnesota in Minnesota. So I was a special team uh, player, and then I was a third down linebacker. I walk in and Coach Campbell looks at me and he goes, Dad, you're not gonna be happy. I said, what is it, Coach? He said, you're not gonna play that much this week. I said, what do you mean? They do something very different. They run five receivers, five wide. We don't want you in there covering the third receiver. So I go on the week, so I'm watching tape, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I'm watching film. I was like, so mad, because I knew I was gonna get much practice and much playing time. So I'm watching this like, Freaking Chris Carter. And the guy, can't, he got one slot option, he runs X return. That's all he does, he just, he just runs around. You're inside leverage, he runs outside. You're outside leverage, he runs inside. I was like, dude, how can I not play? I do remember that game. It was one of those games where, like you said, it, it was early in his career, and you know, just like in pro football, next man up mentality, things are gonna happen. So right before the half, they ran the ball to the sideline. So I go over there, I made the tackle on Robert Smith. All of a sudden, we popped up. Mass substitution, five wide. George Edwards go, hey, hey, no, no, that, just stay, just stay. And we call. Whenever it goes five wide, it's always three receivers on one side and two on the other. 
And uh, when you line up, you always count from the outside in. One, two, three, and you're really defending that guy. And usually it's Chris Carter. So I lined up, one, two, three. And I looked up, it wasn't Chris Carter. It was Randy Moss. He looked at me, he shook his head. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, shoot. He was looking to the side, like, okay, what do I do? Well, the thing he's going to have to do is back up because Randy Miles is a lot taller and a lot faster. I was looking for Woody and I was looking for George. I was like, hey, I got to need somebody to double this guy with me, right? He's about to hit his head in the goalpost, man. So he decided to run a slant. And he's about to score. Everybody in the country is going to watch this play. It's going to be on ESPN, da 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 Everybody's going to see this. So I had to do something, so I stuck my foot out and I tripped him, <laughs> and he fell down. I don't know why they didn't throw the ball to him, and then he got up, he tapped me in behind, he goes, nice move. <laughs> that kind of quick thinking and ability to react was a result of Wynn's meticulous preparation. Even as a rookie, he made sure he was ready. Defense is a complicated thing, especially at this level. This is a finely tuned, engineering-like machine when it's working well, and he was just made for that. His work ethic led to that where he, he was never slow on a read. He knew he had to get to where he needed to get. Just from day to day, you knew what you were going to get every single day. He was going to be in there, you know, trying to do the little details that were going to make the big things happen for him. He was so smart. He, 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 he could diagnose plays and by formations uh, where the ball was going. And uh, I think that certainly helped him. Uh, make it in the NFL. Very cerebral, very smart, could always get to where he needed to get. For this one Cowboy, there was no surprise. One thing about him, when he's looking at tape, when he's getting prepared for something, he would always have a checklist of just questions to go through. And they might be things that are outside the framework of what we're anticipating them doing, but something he had done, you know, tape study from some games outside of it. He's a very smart guy, and you underestimate that at your peril. He was, he's just got such a super organized, analytical approach, and that, I think, is innate in him. That's one of his qualities that made him a natural for a leadership role. That leadership is something the coaching staff immediately saw as well. Let's go, they don't get in. Face, switch it, go, race. Despite being in his rookie season, Wynn was tasked with calling the defensive alignment when he was on the field. If you're going to have a rookie calling plays, then he has to not only be smart, but he has to have the natural leadership qualities that will make other players respond to him regardless of his physical stature or where he is chronologically on the roster. It's not that you got to have this, you know, big rah-rah personality or anything. Players know talent, uh, especially the guys that are on the field, and I think that's what created uh, somewhat of a leadership uh, part for him. Yeah, and, and then he just, all he did was make plays. He was a guy that was going to lead by example. You know, like I said, every day he was out there, he, had, he was in charge of communication, he was in charge of adjustments, he was in charge of, you know, just making sure everybody around him felt comfortable. Um, Dad and I particularly had to be aligned because he would make sure that the front seven, the linemen and the linebackers were lined up, and then I'd have to speak to Dad so that I could get the secondary to match. And so um, during the play, during the, the call, I, I had to be all eyes on or all ears on him to hear what he had to say. They knew exactly who he was going to be every single day, that he was going to be accountable for whatever call it was going to be made, whatever adjustment needed to be made, whether we needed to make it a front adjustment or a coverage adjustment, he was going to be on top of those things. I mean, that win, whatever you want me to do. And if you want me to lead, clear me a path. Wynn would go on to finish his rookie season with 43 tackles, including five tackles for loss. He also recorded his first career interception on October 3rd, 1999, in a 35-7 win over the Arizona Cardinals. It was meant to be that I was be a, a Dallas Cowboy, and, uh, and I think that's what's cool about the experience. I, I think everybody in the locker room respected that, and he, he held them himself to that, that standard that he was going to give his best every day. It was an impressive start to an impressive career, 
Dat Wynn would go on to play seven seasons in the NFL, all with the Cowboys. He led Dallas in tackles three times, including a team credited 173 takedowns in 2001, his personal high. When you look up the uh, definition of an overachiever, that was that on and off the field every single day. With that coming to our team and understanding his family background and what he was raised on with being smart, being disciplined, he would always pull us together because of that. That win retired after the 2005 season with 665 tackles, a total that still ranks 15th in franchise history. More importantly, he also left the game as one of the most respected players to ever wear the star. His values are so appropriately lined up to the way most people want their children to be raised. He was a fun, loving, hardworking person who you knew was going to get there and you just were amazed at, at the way that that played football. I, I think he was a guy that everybody could count on. And I know as a coach you could count on him being accountable. I think it was a great brother, a great son, uh, I mean, a great husband, a great father. I mean, it, this guy is, if you were going to draw him up, this is what you're looking for, both on and off the field. He's a great kid. And I couldn't ask for anything better, you know, for me to grow up in the state of Texas, play all three level of the game of football in the state, in the Lone Star State, and many people can't say that. Yeah. And for me to experience that and, and to end my career with the Cowboys, and it was a great experience. I'm so thankful and grateful for all the opportunities. The Dallas Cowboys Legends Show was presented by AT&T, an official sponsor of the Dallas Cowboys, and by the Texas Lottery. Dallas Cowboys scratch tickets from the Texas Lottery are here. Play today.